So I'm going to introduce you. If you if you want to use a laser pointer, this has a laser pointer and a slide advance, and this is just a slide advance. Ah, that's so you, good. You could use either one, but I, several people have said, "Oh, there's no laser pointer." All right. Okay. 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 We are now in the home stretch. And so uh, I want to welcome you back for the last uh, panel of today. Uh, and then we've got a whole big day tomorrow. Um, so let me uh, very briefly introduce the moderator and first speaker of the, I think you're speaking first, right? Yes, of this, uh, this uh, panel, uh, Emily Landon. Uh, Dr. Landon specializes in infectious diseases and leads the academic health systems infection control and prevention efforts. Um, she is a member of the McLean Center faculty, has been very involved in multiple um, uh, advising capacities uh, in state and local level throughout uh, the pandemic. And um, she is a national expert on automated monitoring of hand hygiene. So, Emily, welcome. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm I'm going to just jump right in here because I think I have more to. I think my talk is a bit on the long side, and there's really no one to hold me accountable to that. So, sorry. Um, but I know it says that I'm going to talk about mandatory public health efforts in a pandemic, but this is really that. I'm just going to use Ebola and quarantine as a good example. And why Ebola, you might ask? Well, because there is actually another Ebola outbreak. So this time the Ebola outbreak is in Uganda, and all of the main things that we got from Ebola Zaire that we saw in Western Africa, which were outstanding vaccines, monoclonal antibody therapies, other treatments, and rapid testing that's easily available in resource-poor settings, that's all doesn't work very well with this other variant called Ebola Sudan. This should all sound relatively familiar to you, not because of Ebola, but because of other things. Right now, there are about 131 cases in about seven different districts, and we have seen some uh, community transmission in Kampala. We're screening travelers at airports, and we expect that there may be returning healthcare workers and other things, just like what we saw in 2014. In order for us to answer the question about whether or not things like quarantine are necessary and any sort of sort of public health mitigation measure is necessary. We need to understand about the disease first. So just a reminder about Ebola for those of you who didn't get to know it in 2014 like I did. People who are exposed to Ebola have about a, a seven or two to 21 day incubation period. During that time, they are not contagious. People who have Ebola are not at all contagious until they develop symptoms and then their contagiousness is low. Only blood and bodily fluids in the first couple of days when they have dry symptoms until they have wet symptoms and then they become more and more contagious throughout the course of the illness. This is very different than what we saw with COVID, right? Where the peak of infectiousness is at the very beginning of your symptoms and then it decreases over time. It's important to understand this infectiousness and its relation to symptoms when we make decisions about what's going on with patients and how to make um, these sort of requirements and recommendations. Every disease is not the same. Another thing that we need to clarify here in order for us to move forward on this topic is that technically, while we may be using the terms isolation and quarantine in a very, um, in the vernacular way, we sort of interchange them, they are different. Patients who are already infected, have symptoms, are isolated. Those who are well and may become sick are quarantined. Another last orientation here before we get into the topic in earnest, it's important to remember that what we've been talking about all day is a lot of medical ethics. This is about an individual, about finding the right treatment, about protecting autonomy, about treating disease and helping people make good decisions. 
public health looks at things very differently. We look at populations of people, whole communities. We think about preventing disease, and we think about how we can have people report things so that we can do, make the policies and the changes that we need to do in order to help prevent diseases that might affect the whole community. And this is really difficult for us sometimes as medical ethicists or as physicians or as carers at all in healthcare, because we have to sometimes think about how letting our patient with the, you know, multi-drug resistant bacteria wander the hallways may be dangerous to the other patient that we're taking care of. And it can create a little bit of friction there. And walking across that bridge is something that I do a lot, but that you might not. And so we're going to talk about that here. Quarantine. Quarantine gets its name from 40 days because the Italians in Venice were the first people to do this quarantine back in the 1300s. They had ships wait in the bay for 40 days to make sure that people were not sick before they brought their goods or their people ashore in order to prevent plague from spreading into Venice. Since then, quarantine has been used many, many times in many, many ways. The United States has a very interesting way of doing quarantine. Most countries have cent centralized public health for the entire nation. We do not. In the United States, public health is a state's issue. And so each state has its own public health. The CDC actually makes no rules. They can only advise state public health departments on what to do within the state. The government does have federal quarantines, but this is only related to our borders and interstate commerce, which is why the CDC was able to maintain masking in airplanes and other transportation, but weren't able to mandate that people wear masks in grocery stores. Thomas Carlyle in the 1800s said, and I think this kind of sums it up, isolation is the sum total of wretchedness to a man or a woman. I'm sure he would have meant that, being inclusive. But or a non-binary person, whatever, you understand. This is important. And now we all know after our experiences of isolation during COVID that it is pretty bad. I mean, having your liberty taken from you when you're not even sick yet, like if you have been exposed to something and you are already worried that you might get sick with it, the last thing you wanna do is give up your last days of freedom before you become ill. What about the paternalistic way in which we just sort of tell people, nope, you, you just stay home now. People lose jobs. There are the public health acts that we have in the United States while they were updated in 2001 or in 2002 after the after 9-11, they really don't make very many provisions for providing, protecting people from job loss and things like that if they have to remain at home during a quarantine. Plus it's really boring. I mean, don't you remember how bored you got and all the things that we decided to do when we were at home during our stay-at-home order? Plus, it, it increases that fear. And we know, and we knew long before there were stay-at-home orders, that people were more likely to have anxiety and depression when they were stuck in quarantine. And it's coercive, just plain coercive. It's telling people they need to do something against their own self-interest. There's a better argument for isolation once somebody is actually sick, but it's not awesome for telling people who are well to stay home. However, we can make that argument stronger with something that um, I'm gonna explain here. Well, actually, first I'm gonna talk about how we get to a place where we can find ourselves making recommendations or requirements that tell people that they need to stay home. And these things apply also to things like wearing masks or stay at home orders. These are just different gradations of the same requirement issue. We already covered the double effect, so I'm not going to cover it here, but it does apply. There's also the precautionary principle, which the CDC has been broadly harangued for using too much and saying that we don't have the evidence for some of these things. But I will remind you that all medical evidence is provisional, technically, until there's a new study that comes along and says something different than what we're working with right now. So there is nothing that is truly not precautionary in the way the precautionary principle needs to be part of anything. We just need to find a way to use it appropriately. I want to talk a little bit about something that Peter Singer, a, a story, a parable that Peter Singer uses to describe what he calls an easy rescue. He tells a story of imagine yourself walking to work through a park and on the way you walk past a little pond that you know is very shallow and you are dressed in your suit, ready to go to your job and you see a child that is drowning in the pond. Do you stop to save the child? There's no one else around. 
Most of us would stop to save a child drowning in a shallow pond. In fact, according to Peter Singer, this is an easy rescue, right? There's, he says, if it is in our power to prevent something bad from happening without thereby sacrificing anything of comparable moral importance, we ought morally to do it. And I think you all would agree that someone who prized their clean suit over the life of a child drowning in a shallow pond is not making good decisions. However, that situation can change and that easy rescue can get a little bit more challenging with just a little bit of things added in. What if the person that's going to work is rushing off to do a heart transplant and every minute that they are waiting to get there, the organ is getting less and less vital? What if the Water is actually much deeper and you're not sure whether or not you can swim well enough to save the child. What if the child is already lifeless and there may not be an opportunity to save that child? What if it happens every single day on your way to work? Perhaps we could come up with a better plan than just you rescuing a child every single day. It might be time for a lifeguard, right? So this easy rescue isn't always as easy as we think it is, but it does challenge us to consider whether or not the additional benefit of having a moral obligation to do something makes it better when the states also require us to do it. For example, when a state or a governing body tells you that you must do something, you may not be able, as from an autonomous person, you can still think about whether or not you should or should not comply with that order. In the case of something where you ought to do it anyway, there is a lot better argument for making you do something when really most people believe that it ought to be done. And that's kind of important because it impacts whether or not we have the buy-in or the, the care or the, the ability to do these things. But people don't always agree on what is an easy rescue and what is not. So the first statistic up here in the quarantine laws, I just think is kind of funny because um, it was way, way, way before COVID, but 90% of Americans said that they would voluntarily abide by a quarantine. Um, but here's what the law says about when we can quarantine people. It says that if the individual is truly dangerous, if the confinement is the least restrictive alternative that protects from the danger, and if the individual is afforded procedural due process. That's what the law has been established. I don't know what today's Supreme Court would say, but this is a previous Supreme Court finding regarding um, quarantine. The AMA wrote in its Code of Ethics, and you'll see I have the dates prominent here because it matters when they were written and in the context of what was happening at the time. The AMA said in 2010, so this is this is after SARS number one, 1.0, um, but before Ebola, that you should, physicians should really be in favor of quarantine. But if we use the least restrictive measures, there's that word again, least restrictive. And if it's based on science and doesn't single out certain groups, for example, um, for a little while and during the First World War, we put all of the um, sex commercial sex workers in prison in order to, to reduce venereal disease, but we didn't do anything for the men that might have it. Um, physicians should advocate for confidentiality. We should educate people about why they're being quarantined, and we should advocate for the appropriate protections for the people who are caring for them while they're in quarantine. I think these are all very reasonable. Lawrence Gostin, who's, who's written a lot about this, wrote um, just after SARS 1.0 and, and reiterated in 2006 when discussing influenza pandemic preparedness, some of the same things. If we follow the precautionary principle, he doesn't really say exactly how well in other things he does, but we're going to leave that for now. We use the least restrictive alternative. The health system is, is transparent about who is going to be quarantined and when. That there's a sense of fairness, that fairness is now starting to come back in. And that we, um, individuals, this is the first time we've heard this, that individuals who are quarantined are justly compensated for the sacrifice that they've made. And also they say that, he says that the health system needs to abide by the rule of law. So Mark Robinson writes a Hastings report after Ebola in 2014. He writes in, in the Hastings report in response to um, some really kind of sketchy quarantines um, that science supports quarantine to prevent the spread of disease and it, it, it needs to actually work medically. You also need to select individuals that are reasonable, meaning like people who were likely to have been exposed because while it may seem like everybody in Uganda has Ebola, I wanna point out that 131 people in an entire country and many of them are in Ebola treatment centers isn't really all that many. 
Um, the duration of the quarantine has to be reasonable, not longer than the incubation period. The place and manner need to be reasonable, and individuals need to get that due process. There's that due process again. The public said, now, these are Canadian public. I couldn't find anything about American public that was recent. This is the closest I could get. So this is the Canadian public said, and they really focus on fairness. They want it to be fair when it can be ordered, fair that everybody has to do it, that people are compensated in some way, and that we do all the things and that we don't ever single out one group. So they really focused on the fairness. I'm also going to say here in, in 1835, this is, I find this really fascinating, a group of anti-contagionist Italians said that cholera wasn't really transmitted person to person and quarantine of ships and other goods was just like a relic of something that we used to do like in the old times. And it's basically useless and it was really bad for commerce. And that's why we shouldn't have uh, quarantine anymore. They did not win. But I want to point out that there has been definite arguments against public health measures like this for as long as there have been public health measures. Ross Upshur actually wrote these. Um, these are the four principles for the justification of public health intervention. And this is kind of like the money information here about uh, back after SARS 1.0. It's been reiterated and, and cited a million times. Uh, there must be, he says, poor, he's like a lumper, not a splitter. So he says there must be person to person spread that's mitigated by the quarantine. So the quarantine has to actually do some good. There must, we must use that least restrictive thing again. He thinks that people should, there should be some reciprocity. People should get something back. They should at least be try. we should try and make them whole for what they've given up. And that there should be transparency and due process, meaning people should know who's going to be quarantined and why, and they should be able to appeal to some kind of authority. These are probably the best synthesis of what everyone else has written about when um, public health interventions can be ordered on other people and your liberties can be trampled and taken away. So when we talk about this particular case of Ebola, and we're, we're, I'm purposefully not rehashing all of COVID here, because I think we need to think about what we're going to forward, right? We have to think about this risk-benefit balancing act, and where does it come out with all of these questions that we have? So what, how, I think I ask myself these questions when I think about what I'm going to recommend to different places about what they're going to do with their pandemic preparedness, and it is how effective is the intervention? How restrictive is that remedy? And most importantly, who's deciding which costs and benefits need to be in the equation? Who's deciding how much we're going to value disabled people, higher risk people, vulnerable individuals? That's kind of important. Are they worth more because they're more vulnerable? Or are they worth less because they're a smaller group? And that is a very important lens to think about as we move forward. Is there any other way to mitigate the cost? Is there any way to make it better for people, sweeten the deal, so to speak? And is there some other way to get the same benefit for less cost? So, so let's take this and apply it to Ebola. These are the, the things from um, Ross Upshur. If it works to prevent the spread of Ebola, I've given you the tools now to answer this question. Yeah, certainly um, we're able to identify individuals who may have been exposed, and we could get them into quarantine fast enough. Twenty-one days is a big, long time. Seven is the you know sort of four to seventeen is the short is the most likely end. But the problem is that patients with Ebola virus disease aren't contagious until symptoms start. Now, some might say we need to have them in an isolation area when their symptoms start so that we can keep them from spreading it to other people. But we also know that when Eric um, Duncan came to that hospital in Texas, he came to the hospital, was seen for, told he had sinusitis, given antibiotics and sent away, had labs done on the regular system. He had a fever. He was in the very early stages of Ebola, the dry symptoms, had contact with lots and lots of people in no isolation, tons of contacts in the waiting room and nobody got Ebola because it's not very common to spread. So I would argue that we have time to move these individuals into a safer place if we're able to find those symptoms early. So is it the least restrictive thing to do to keep them in quarantine? I don't think so. I think that if it's such few people, because we don't have current ongoing community-based spread in the United States, we can certainly identify these people. We are already at the airport and we are following them by checking up on them and checking their temperatures daily and calling in to talk to them. And we can make decisions about escalating that after we find out whether or not they're compliant with a lower level of um, monitoring. Is it fairly applied? 
Well, I think in the United States, we can identify everybody that's coming through our borders because we don't have any sort of community transmission going on right now. But I do think that there's a problem with assuming that everyone who's been to Uganda has exposure to someone that had Ebola. And that's certainly not what public health is, is even remotely um, uh, suggesting. But many people do think that when they think about their fear of Ebola, they think about how afraid they are of Ebola and not so much about how big the country of Uganda actually is. So the individual costs are proportional or minimized. Well, 21 days of quarantine is kind of a long time. And there's no real clear system in the United States for giving people groceries, delivering food. Some other places pay people or um, give them am amnesty. Massachusetts actually has a law in the book saying that they'll pay you every day if you're in quarantine. Unfortunately, it was written in 1907 and it maxed out at $3 a day. It's less useful. Um, but this, you know, Ebola, there's so few people that we could probably just cobble together a way to be able to pay for them, right? But that, that, cha that answer changes when there's more people involved. And there is a way, is there a way to appeal this restriction? Well, obviously with so few people and so many lawyers here in the United States, sorry, Valerie, um, I'm sure someone would help them if they needed to. And, and many people did, did do that. But this, this, this is what Casey Hickox, the nurse that went to take care of Ebola patients in Western Africa came back to when she returned to New Jersey. She wore all of her PPE, she was asymptomatic, had no fever, and this is where they wanted to put her for 21 days. And she pushed against that. And she was vilified early on in the media. I think that was wrong. This is not humane or normal or acceptable when we know that she did not pose any danger to anyone. She could have gone to her house, stayed at home, laid low, taken her temperature every day, and gone to a hospital if she got sick. So in conclusion, in the setting of imported cases only, quarantine for individuals who may have been exposed to Ebola virus disease are not ethically or probably legally permissible. In the setting of community transmission of a deadly disease, in this case, we're talking about Ebola, but we could be talking about another one, without the ability to identify who's sick and who's been exposed and not being able to figure out who needs to be cared for, it may be reasonable to do temporary short mass quarantines in order to figure out how to separate those who are exposed from those who are not, those who are ill from those who are well, and figure out, but you need to sweeten the deal in some way, which I think we probably didn't do enough of here in the United States when we did this for COVID. In um, the fact that this is on the list, by the way, the United States has a list of quarantinable diseases and Ebola is on that list. I don't understand why we have that list. I don't think this disease in its current situation belongs on that list. I'm not sure we should have a list because it, the context of the disease matters so much more than the disease itself, but the disease does matter. And Ebola would not be my first choice for putting on a quarantinable list. Isolation list, 100%. Quarantine list, not so much. I think that uh, Ross Upshur, again, has it right when he says an ethical approach requires us to be inclusive in our definitions based on facts and values, what we're trying to accomplish, clearly stating what it is our goals are, as a goal to mitigate people's fears and make people feel better by separating people who aren't, uh, by taking away the liberty of some who are perceived to be risky. I don't think I want that as an American. I would prefer for us to stick to things that actually prevent health related issues. And I want to thank all of you for um, going along with my mandates that I recommended about wearing masks here today, because I think you now understand that while a lot of the other mitigations and things that we've talked about are pretty risky, wearing a mask is a lot like rescuing a drowning child in a shallow pond, except it's even easier. And I don't think I have time for questions. Do I? See, I told you I was going to go over. All right. Um, so I don't have questions, but I will um, chat with you all later um, about that. And I'm really, really excited to introduce our next speaker. And I have to put on my glasses because I'm old now. And um, Lydia Dugdale, I think she's joining us by, hey, Lydia, how are you? Um, Lydia Dugdale is the Dorothy and Daniel H. Silberg Associate Professor of Medicine at Columbia University of Aguelos College, 
of physicians and surgeons and the director of the Center for Clinical Medical Ethics. That's all one sentence. That's a lot of titles. It's academic medicine. Instead of raises, they give you time. No, it's great. Um, and uh, anyway, I want to point out that she edited The Dying in the 21st Century and is the author of The Lost Art of Dying, a popular press book on the preparation for death. And she wants us to say, and I'm going to say it too, that she singularly credits Dr. Mark Siegler with her pursuit of a career in medical ethics. And thanks, Lydia, you're going to talk to us today about moral injury in COVID-19. Thanks so much, Emily. It's so great to be with all of you. And I'm sorry that I'm not in person. I had planned to be and then uh, family schedules with uh, teenage kids got really complicated. So here we are on Zoom again. Uh, it, following Emily, I'm also going to move rather quickly. Uh, disclosures, I have nothing of interest. Um, and this is where I'd like to proceed today to talk about this concept of moral injury discuss its relationship to COVID-19, and then consider possible antidotes to moral injury. So I'm going to begin with a case, and this is a case from my own hospital. One of my former residents, Dr. Amanda Rosen, conducted interviews with the medicine residents who were responsible for triage uh, during the worst of the COVID pandemic. And of course, they were on a triage service that was under the uh, under the uh, authority of an attending physician, but given our volume in New York City, in the Washington Heights neighborhood in the spring of 2020, uh, it was uh, a lot of quick decision making uh, all at once. And uh, the resident, one of the residents we interviewed told us about a patient, elderly patient came in with multiple comorbidities admitted from a long term care facility with acute COVID-19 infection. The patient, of course, was obtended, of course, uh, as is so typical, no advanced directive and no surrogate decision maker. The primary team did not believe the patient would survive even with intubation based on the, the entire scenario. They talked to the emergency room attending who says, well, look, we, we have almost no ventilators left. We have a few. And besides, the emergency room is full of patients with COVID-19. And this in our focus group is what the resident had said, the triage medicine resident said. I thought about the oath we take to do no harm and to commit to caring for these people, knowing that you don't have enough resources, knowing that you don't have enough staff, knowing that you're clearly not at your best and being like, I don't think that I'm caring for you properly. And I think, I am causing you harm. Now, I share this case to illustrate the feelings of shame and guilt that arise when we are forced to violate our deeply held beliefs, values, or ethics. Here, the triage resident uh, felt that he or she, or they was inflicting harm uh, in contrast to our professional oath to do no harm. When this experience happens once, we are distressed, uh, but when it is unrelenting, uh, we develop moral injury. And I'm gonna dive into that just a bit more. So what is this concept of moral injury? Uh, moral injury is similar to, but not synonymous with PTSD. And it occurs when an individual's personal moral paradigm is shattered leaving behind a damaged self-identity driven by core feelings of guilt and shame. So again, this resident says, we take an oath to do no harm, and yet I feel as though I'm causing the patient's harm. I did the wrong thing. I feel guilty. I'm ashamed. That's the kind of language. And this term, uh, not as common in medicine, actually uh, applies, initially it applied to combat soldiers who returning from terrible situations in conflict came to see themselves as morally deficient. Uh, they returned from battle, not only psychologically, but also emotionally, and you might even say spiritually injured. Now this concept originates with Veterans Affairs psychiatrist, Jonathan Shea, and I thought it was interesting that here we are on Veterans Day, I'm, I'm giving this talk. Jonathan Shea, a VA psychiatrist, originated the term. He has quite a long and esteemed career of working with veterans. According to Shea, the current most precise and, and narrow definition of moral injury has three parts that I've listed here on this slide. Moral injury is present when there has been a betrayal of what is morally correct 
by someone who holds legitimate authority in a high stakes situation. Moral injury, Shea says, and that here I'm quoting him, it wrecks veterans' lives. He also says it crushes them to suicide. Or to put it another way, Shea describes moral injury as, quote, the soul wound inflicted by doing something that violates one's own ethics, ideals, or attachments, end quote. Now, again, in contrast to PTSD, where veterans feel a loss of safety, right? PTSD is often characterized by this fear. Uh, those suffering from moral injury feel a loss of trust. They feel betrayed by those in authority. They feel that those in authority made possible their being a perpetrator or a victim of or a witness to these acts that violate their deeply held moral beliefs. Now, medical professionals have adopted parallel terms that aren't precisely the same as moral injury, but they're similar. And so I'm going to flesh this out for a second. For example, moral distress, I put it here on the slide, is common in the nursing literature. And uh, it was initially uh, defined by Andrew Jamatin in his 1984 book titled Nursing Practice, the Ethical Issues. Jamatin describes moral distress as the psychological distress of being in a situation in which one is constrained from acting on what one knows to be right. This concept of moral distress uh, is best described among nurses because, of course, nurses often bear the responsibility for carrying out the orders, the plans of care, um, over which they may feel they have little or no authority. Moral distress can wax and wane around precipitating events. So for example, we often hear about nursing distress uh, in cases of so-called futile care. And there's a lot to say about that, but just work with me here. Um, uh, caring for a patient everyone knows is actively dying, but yet uh, needs to be maintained on life support can often cause quite a lot of care team distress. Now the nurse's distress may resolve uh, when she leaves her shift uh, or when the patient dies. While it wanes, uh, sometimes it doesn't uh, go away completely. And there's something called moral residue where there is the accumulated uh, moral distress that builds up over time. So let me just, again, put these, uh, compare these three together. Uh, if combat veterans talk about moral injury and nurses talk about moral distress, then the term that physicians uh, often embrace is burnout. Now, as with moral injury and moral distress, burnout has its own definition, which most commonly is a combination of emotional exhaustion, depersonalization, and a sense of reduced personal accomplishment. Uh, just uh, recently, the sort of famous uh, Stanford uh, burnout researcher, Tate Shanafelt and his team evaluated the prevalence of burnout in US physicians at the end of 2021. Uh, this was about 21 months into the COVID pandemic and they compared to earlier years. So the x-axis here is 2011 all the way up to 2021. The top graph on the y-axis shows mean emotional exhaustion scores. And what Shanna Felt and his colleagues showed is that in the last year from 2020 to 2021, mean emotional exhaustion increased by about 38%. Whereas mean depersonalization scores on that lower graph there increased by about 60%. What Shanna Felt and his colleagues tell us uh, in this study of theirs is that overall 62% of physicians had at least one manifestation of burnout in 2021, 62%. And I think it was the 2014 study is when we got above 50% and that made all the headlines. So now in 2021, we have 62%. But there are two things I want to say about Shanna Felt's data here in this slide. First is that having one symptom of burnout does not correlate with the wholesale leave the profession sort of burnout that we think of as kind of the end stage of burnout. That matters for something I'm going to show you in a second. The second thing I want to tell you about this data is the fact that arguably most of us aren't at that late stage of burnout means that there is 
some hope. So recently, colleagues and I published a, a paper in the Journal of General Internal Medicine in which we argued that moral injury is not itself burnout. And we offered this heuristic uh, to show the interplay between, or among, I should say, moral awareness, distress, injury, and burnout. And we argue that these four exist on a spectrum. Moral distress, if sustained, is a common cause of moral injury. If unchecked, moral injury then leads to burnout. Now, in practice, this continuum is often uneven. There can be movement back and forth, right? Something could be morally injurious, but if there's no continued assault, moral assault, right? Moral distress uh, ceases, then perhaps you move from moral injury back to moral distress, maybe even all the way back to moral awareness. However, it could also be the case that a singularly, um, a singular morally distressing event could be so terrible that you know you almost skip moral injury and end up in burnout. So, so we, we don't have to be um, you know super strict with this, but we're trying to lay this out that that maybe these these things have an interrelationship. Um, but it, but the other the other reason we lay this out is because this idea of burnout. Um, at its extreme, not the sort of one symptom of burnout, today I'm emotionally exhausted, but burnout at its extreme correlates with an emotional numbness. And that's when people uh, end up um, leaving the profession, uh, taking their lives by suicide, addicted to substances or what have you, right? That's the sort of wholesale burnout. And most physicians, the Shanavel says 62% have one symptom of burnout. Most physicians uh, and clinicians are not, I, I hope, and I think this gives us reason for hope, at that extreme. Now, COVID-19 has arguably made moral injury worse. Of course, Shanafelt suggests that burnout is worse. I, I would suggest to you that moral injury has also been made worse by COVID-19. Moral injury researchers have suggested that there exist many different types of morally conflictual elements of service that could be counted as moral injury. So the initial definition by Jonathan Shea had to do with betrayal by an authority in a high stakes situation, but subsequent researchers have suggested that that's too narrow, that maybe the authority does not have to be the one who's betraying us, but circumstances also can lead us to violate our deeply held moral beliefs and lead to moral injury. And again, I think that's what the case of the resident uh, suggested from the outset. Um, we know that the pandemic caused moral injury. We know that people felt that they were supposed to be uh, treating patients with the highest standards of care and yet had scarce resources, that we were limited in staff that there was significant fear and anxiety over work environment, getting sick ourselves and taking the virus home to patients and families. We know that the idea of having to figure out who gets the ventilator or who, worse still, who gets the ECMO or the hemodialysis, which were significantly limited in our hospital, was causing great moral injury to physicians. The, the idea that the situation itself, the circumstances themselves would constrain us from acting, from caring in the way that we believe to be the most ethical was morally injurious. Of course, this was all sustained over a long period of time without reprieve. Again, as that resident said, I quoted from the outset, we take an oath to do no harm, and yet we feel as though we are causing harm. So our intuition then is that moral injury has been a problem, but we've had a hard time assessing it uh, in part because there hasn't been a good measure. And of course, doctors like measures. So Koenig and colleagues, um, Koenig is at Duke, adapted this 45 item moral injury scale that the military developed. They turned it into a 10 item scale for, for clinicians. And then some of this group took this 10 item scale and applied it to, to uh, healthcare workers in China during the outset of the pandemic. They uh, use an online survey tool from late March to late April of 2020. And they also administered this 10 item moral injury scale together with assessments of mental health. They, they included about 3000 doctors and nurses in their final analysis. 
And what they found, of course, is that this score, this 10 item moral injury score, strongly and positively correlated with what you might think depression, anxiety, low well being, and symptoms of burnout. Uh, the estimated prevalence uh, they got was about 41% of folks said they had moral injury, according again to this measure. And um, those who were frontline healthcare workers for COVID positive patients had about a 28% greater risk of moral injury than those who were still working clinically but not caring for COVID patients. So, this is the measure applied to China. But of course, we've seen the uh, idea of moral injury manifest in other ways. Here from the Atlantic, in the first 18 months of the pandemic, some 20% of the healthcare workforce left its jobs. Here, uh, Elsevier Health, in their Clinician of the Future study, uh, reported the results of a large scale global survey, which found that 47% of US healthcare workers plan to leave their positions by 2025. You'll note this was just published in April of 2022, fairly recent, and yet we can expect in the next three years, 47% um, of healthcare workers will leave. Incidentally, the number is the same in Germany and the UK, 47 to 48% of healthcare workers plan to leave their posts. Uh, we also have seen that the U.S. Surgeon General, uh, Dr. Vivek Murthy, has taken quite an interest in this, as has the CDC. Uh, there is a national mental health crisis. And so the question then is, what do we do about this? Um, and specifically, how do we treat moral injury? Because if moral injury is the place where we can intervene uh, prior to this wholesale burnout, then what can be done about it? Now, Koenig and colleagues uh, argue that their scale is important for diagnosing moral injury and for monitoring response to treatment. But those who work with combat veterans suggest a couple of things. One is that we don't want to pathologize normal reactions to traumatic experiences. So if we give you the moral injury scale and you were a frontline healthcare worker during the worst of the COVID pandemic and you rank high, you score a high number on this moral injury scale, we don't want to then uh, subject you to some sort of rigorous treatment program because the trauma that you experience is a normal response to going through these unprecedented and terrible circumstances. Um, some people have suggested that these 10 point scales should be done away with altogether and not ever applied uh, to healthcare workers or, uh, for that matter, to combat veterans. So, one such person is uh, a psychiatrist at Duke named uh, Warren Kinghorn. He sees patients at the Durham VA Hospital and he's really um, built some of his career around treating moral injury among combat veterans. And he's come to the conclusion that. Conceiving of moral injury as a syndrome and treatment as oriented at least formally towards symptom reduction, right? Keep giving that 10 point scale again and again and monitor for, for symptom reduction, that this method is very problematic. And he says, to the extent that it is happening, it is problematic because four reasons I'm going to give you. First, it situates the locus of pathology in the individual veteran. There's so much about trauma we don't understand. And so rather than uh, sort of blaming the victim, if you will, right, rather than saying there's a problem with you because you have a lot of moral injury, we should rather ex ex uh, approach the one who has been traumatized in a spirit of humility. Second, Dr. Kinghorn says that focusing on symptom reduction renders context superfluous when it's not. And I'll circle back to that also. Third, he says a focus on symptom reduction invites potentially problematic technological solutions. Uh, so for example, he says, do we need new constructs and measurement tools or do we need to listen to the embattled on the front lines? And I think for those of you who cared for COVID patients, again, you'd say, actually, if the, if the healthcare leadership would just show up and listen to what we went through, uh, there would be a different kind of conversation. Uh, and then next, a conceiving of moral injury as a syndrome contributes to unnecessary stigma. So Kinghorn, I need to rush through this really quickly, but I want, I'm going to take two more minutes, Emily. Uh, Kinghorn finds Koenig's uh, scale uh, problematic 
Instead, he offers 10 things, which I've reduced to these five, which is listen, don't pathologize, obviously get mental health treatment when needed, remember context, empower for change, there's a lot to say there, and engage community. And I'm gonna pick up on the third and fifth here. So um, these last two. Uh, so let me say this, systems change. The financial structure of medicine is killing clinicians. And I will say one of the, probably the foremost physician working on moral injury right now is Dr. Wendy Dean. She has a book coming out titled, If I Betray These Words, which is an incredible look at the financial structures in medicine, but it is killing physicians and driving so many from healthcare. Uh, requiring primary care doctors or other clinicians, for example, to see 25 or 30 sick patients a day forces doctors to dehumanize themselves and to dehumanize their patients just to make it through the workday. Systems changes would require healthcare leadership to put their money where their mouth is. If it's true, for example, as we always say, that patients come first, then health systems must accept lower revenue for more patient-facing time. They must hire more support staff, and they must fundraise not only for highly lucrative centers, but also for patient care. If we can't afford to care for patients, then we should subsidize it. We should figure out how to do that. Second, um, Healthcare leadership should ensure that its environments offer the healing they purport to provide. This could come through the use of biophilic design in the clinic space, ensuring quiet workrooms for clinicians, and reviving the practice of physician and staff lunchrooms for fostering community and cohesion. Final point. The military has a battle buddy program that pairs veterans with one another and makes them responsible for regularly checking in on each other's mental health. Healthcare systems could do the same uh, to help encourage community, to help foster relationships with colleagues who understand the challenges faced. Um, it will help us identify downturn in thoughts and behavior and connect people with needed resources. So much to say about this, but what I want to do is conclude um, on a hopeful note, because I think that this can be very overwhelming. The systems are very broken and there's so much work to be done. And often it feels as though the clinicians are not heard, but let me just leave you with a quotation from uh, the great uh, Dutch scholar, Henry Nouwen. When we become aware that we do not have to escape our pains, but that we can mobilize them into a common search for life, those very pains are transformed from expressions of despair into signs of hope. And I hope that we can uh, share this message with one another. Thanks so much. Lydia, that, that was great. I'm, I'm so sorry we don't have time for questions right now for you, especially because you're not here, but maybe we can, um, well, don't, don't leave. We'll see if we can get to you at the end. Although I think they're going to want to go and get drinks, honestly. Um, we're running about five to 10 minutes behind, but it's not entirely my fault or Lydia's fault because you all were late coming back from break. So next up, um, I will, yeah, Will Parker is, is going to talk to us today about abetting equity in, in scarce healthcare resources allocation. It's important to note here that um, Will is, is an assistant professor of pulmonary critical care medicine, one of the people on the front line of taking care of patients with COVID. Um, and his, I mean, I don't know what, there's like a bunch of stuff here that's really great. He, like everybody here, okay, look, he did a lot of really wonderful things and, um, he worked a lot, listen, here's what I know. He takes really great care of patients and he works really hard to create appropriate ways of uh, for us to redistribute scarce resources during the pandemic. And for that, I'm grateful. Uh, thank you, Emily. And uh, thanks to McLean Center for inviting me to speak. Um, I think I'm actually gonna talk about how little I think we really know about scarce healthcare resource allocation in particular, in the context of crisis standards of care and how much work we still need to do. Um, my only disclosure is that partially this work was supported by an NIH K-08 award. Um, so what the question that I my lab focuses on, and I think I'll focus on for the remainder of my career, is how to allocate absolutely scarce healthcare resources. These are things that dramatically improve patients' lives, save their life, um, but unfortunately, demand vastly exceeds the supply. Deceased donor organs for transplantation are the chronic case of an absolutely scarce healthcare resource. You're 
If you're listed for deceased donor kidney transplant today, you're more likely to die or be delisted than receive a transplant in the first three years. And typically, this problem is not solved by a market allocating them, right? Because people just spend all their resources to get the the all their um, to get treatment. But instead, the supply of the resources is centrally controlled, and there's an algorithmic rank ordering of people or triage um, to decide who is treated. And when constructing this rank ordering, this allocation protocol, you have to build it off of an ethical framework. Here is an extensive table of ethical principles and all the example allocation schemes. Certainly don't have time to go through these one by one, but I'm sure most of the people in the room are familiar with them and the way they're implemented in different absolutely scarce healthcare resource allocation problems. And why I think that this is the type of question you could build um, a whole career and a whole lab around is it's enormously complex, both in the normative ethics, but balancing these often conflicting competing principles and about the practical details of constructing a concrete allocation protocol. Anytime a deceased donor, um, an, an organ donor becomes available, made available for transplantation, an algorithm run that literally produces a rank ordering of everyone in the wait list in the United States. That's intensely empirical, it's intensely difficult, and relies on lots of observed empirical data. Um, and what I think is so interesting about that practical process of constructing the allocation protocol is it often makes you re-examine the ethics. And I guess what really got me hooked on clinical medical ethics, bioethics in general, is getting to work with Lainey Ross as a, a medical student in developing a novel ethical framework for deceased donor kidney allocation. And I was lucky enough to be the one to come up with a very crude practical protocol to fulfill that framework. So the big question I want to address today in this talk is, should scarce healthcare resource allocation protocols, and I guess it's generalizable to all the different clinical problems I've discussed so far, attempt to correct structural inequity? And what do I mean by that? that this recognizes that there's some people who are entering into the allocation game at a severe disadvantage. And should there be normative ethical weight placed upon preferentially allocating the resource to those people? And COVID, I think, hammers home how unequal our society is and how unequal disease can be. Uh, this is a very uh, famous, now infamous paper uh, from the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic which recorded the death, this is, this is Cook County uh, death data, by the way, this is all publicly available, the addresses of everyone who died, the two first 270 people who died of COVID across the city, um, 63, two, per, two thirds of the people were African-American, they're the white circles on this map. And you can see they're concentrated in particular communities that are the, the, the classic, uh, unfortunately, uh, impoverished vulnerable areas of the city. Um, this is the so-called one map of Chicago. Um, and of course, this map didn't happen by accident. This map was created uh, by our beginning by our policy actions of our government in the in the 1930s um, and is part of the system of structural violence where, that we've heard a lot about today, particularly starting with Dr. Rogers talk this morning about how the lack of a trauma center in this large catchment area was a form of overt structural violence, preventing people from getting care for traumatic injuries when they needed them. And um, this is the Mapping Inequality website, um, which sort of allows you to click through and literally see the red lines, read the horrendously explicitly racist text that was associated with the way the federal government rank uh, ordered whether or not you should give mortgages or invest in particular communities across uh, different urban environments. And the legacy of redlining we still see today, right? And that directly translates into the one map of, of Chicago for COVID, the same areas that were systematically impoverished by de jure government policies were affected hardest by the virus. And this translated in various other ways of forms of structural violence in the pandemic, there's a relative ice, scarcity of ICU transfers. So patients in these vulnerable areas were unable to get access to the uh, top tier tertiary academic medical centers and died in overwhelmed community hospitals, despite the, the sort of futile attempts of some of us to advocate against that. And the, the reasons for this, unfortunately, were unethical. 
and related to profit and what hospitals would prefer to be do other than taking care of COVID patients. This kept going during uh, vaccine allocation um, when we sort of knew where the fire was burning and where we needed to pour the water. Instead, the most vaccines and the most vaccine sites were delivered to the richest areas of the city, the people with the most political capital and sway, where the existing healthcare system structure made it easier uh, for us to send vaccines. So given that context of profound structural inequity, profound inequity and in the burden of the pandemic, how should we approach crisis standards of care and allocating absolutely scarce healthcare resources like life support and, and, and ECMO? And so I, my objectives the remainder of my time here is to discuss what crisis standard care is, talk about the sequential organ failure assessment score, which is the main tool that most states today would still use to triage life support in an emergency, then talk about the bioethical arguments for and against prioritizing vulnerable groups, and finally present some novel, if I have time, novel approaches that my lab's working on to try to uh, fix this problem or address the problem at least with place-based disadvantage indices. All right, so crisis standards of care, this is Memorial Hospital several days after the levees broke. Um, there's new, now an Apple TV story that's sort of documenting the, well, like several days at Memorial Hospital, uh, what it was like to be inside this hospital as the power failed and it became clear to the physicians trying to take care of patients that they just simply couldn't um, care for over about half of the people who were inside. Um, and this, the Hurricane Katrina, the first influenza pandemic, led the National Academy of Medicine to define crisis standards of care, to sort of name the, the circumstances that can cause the moral injury that Lydia Dugdale just talked about, where you can't take care of everyone and you have to overtly triage. Um, how would states address this? Of course, when the COVID-19 pandemic hurt, hit everyone uh, across the country in various hospitals like ours and at state public health department levels started revising and revisiting um, their ventilator allocation guidelines, their life support allocation guidelines, because of course it's much more than just the actual machine, right? It's the nursing, it's the respiratory therapists, it's the entire staff and ECMO allocation guidelines. And it turns out that most of them would rely on one particular scoring system to rank order people in according to who is most likely to survive, the sequential organ failure assessment score. What is the SOPA score? Definitely not gonna go through the details of here, but it's a consensus scoring system made up by ICU physicians in the 90s. Uh, it's not based on a regression model. So these points are not statistically correlated with a difference in survival, just based on clinical gestalt. And you get different points as your different organ systems fail. And it's kind of remarkable it performs as well as it does. You know, means maybe we do know something, right, about, about what lab values are bad. And it's very useful after ICU admission. So someone's been critically ill in the unit for days, you can follow their SOPA score over time. And as it gets worse, they're more likely to die. However, and so, so it's not surprising that during the pandemic, when we were trying to rank order people based on their expected survival, we reached for this score. It had this history of being well validated. And here's the, the Pennsylvania's interim CSC plan that was widely influential, kind of copied throughout the country, uh, which categorized patients according to their SOPA score and gave them various points. It's like golf. You want lower points in order to get allocated the life support. Um, and there's many other details and other principles that are embedded in here. But the, the fundamental problem with SOPA is it's designed for to, to evaluate how people are doing in the ICU over time. It's not a triage score. Uh, and it cannot rank order patients with COVID before they're in intubating place in mechanical ventilators. And this has gotten to the point where the Department of Health and Human Services is explicitly recommended against SOPA as a triage score because most people initially when they develop COVID-19 pneumonia have low values because they're still getting sick or they're developing respiratory failure and multi-system organ failure. And this is um, a JAMA paper showing that uh, if you just rank order people by how old they are, you are much better at statistically discriminating in who's going to live or die than with SOFA score. In, in addition to being inefficient, SOFA is inequitable. If you compare a white and a black person um, with the same SOPA score, the white person is more likely to die than the black person. So in a triage scenario, 
SOFO would systematically allocate resources towards white people away from black people inappropriately. And why is this? There's a couple of explanations. One is that black patients are more likely to have chronic kidney disease. So you just sort of walk in the door with a higher SOFA score, and that's not correlated to your probability of dying from COVID-19 or any other critical illness necessarily. And then they also have higher laboratory creatinine values as I think many people are aware of based on our new movement to erase free uh, calculation of EGFR. And finally, black patients tend to be younger and younger people survive longer in the ICU. Um, so we, our, our lab was able to confirm this in a different a large electronic health care record data set showing that across these different triage systems that the odds that a black person assigned to a particular priority tier would survive were significantly higher, right? <laughs> Uh, than, than the corresponding white uh, person, again, because this score is systematically miscalibrated and discriminatory. And um, when we simulated pu the published crisis standards of care, uh, we found that by just this is a very simple Monte Carlo simulation where we picked two patients out of the, the sample from a combined sample of University of Chicago and Northwestern data, allocated a hypothetical life support based on who had the higher score, we found that these scores would dramatic, cause dramatic racial and ethnic uh, inequalities without improving efficiency much. Survival, overall survival across the population was very similar whether or not you employed one of these plans using the SOFA score and or just ran a lottery. And that makes sense because as I showed you before, SOFA cannot reliably discriminate between who's gonna live or die prior to um, the de development of critical illness. So how do we fix this problem, right? This is the score that exists. Um, how, you know, how do we address the structural inequity? How do we address the fact that we have a score that seems to be exacerbating that? Um, it turns out that directly using racial or ethnic identity to allocate scarce resources is, is not a practical, political, or legally possible solution. I'm going to be agnostic towards whether or not it would be ethical. But the state of Minnesota tried to do it for how they would allocate um, monoclonal antibodies because they found independent of other observed medical risk factors, race being a, a BIPOC category, a non-white person was independently associated with death through COVID-19. So they tried to allocate mon scarce monoclonal antibodies preferentially to those groups. And they had to back off because of intense political pressure uh, from demagogues who can't really understand what's going on and lie a lot. But I think the, the practical point of using self-identified race or ethnicity to allocate a scarce resource is incredibly uh, in, in pertinent. And uh, from what the lawyers, uh, my lawyer colleagues tell me that it would likely be unconstitutional. So maybe there's a way around this, right? Uh, as I just talked about earlier, the reason that COVID burden is so unequal is because of these forces, these structural forces of redlining and racialized segregation, that there, we've created these communities that have been under-resourced and where the vulnerability is so high. So can't you just directly counteract that with um, the person's place where they live? And fortunately, there's amazing tools that gets down to the census block level of determining where the area, the neighborhoods that people live are the most vulnerable. Um, this is a measure constructed from the American uh, Community Survey and is intensely related to all sorts of health measures and COVID-19 burden. And Doug White from Pittsburgh, who's friend of the McLean Center, proposed an explicit plan to construct a multi-principle score. You see he's abandoned SOFA in here, it's just sort of an unnamed prognostic score, which is sort of a problem. So this is all theoretical right now, but um, that would subtract one point from this score for patients who lived in the most vulnerable areas. Um, ethically, what that's doing is mapping, you know, prioritizing the disadvantage to being about as one, one fourth as important as saving lives. But, this is a good example of how writing down a protocol makes the ethics um, in explicit, right, that are underlying it. Um, and here's an example from their paper about the way that their score would work differently than SOFA. Um, the patient on the left here has is older, who does not live in a disadvantaged area, but has a, a shorter, uh, a lower mortality, a, a lower SOFA score. So a simple system would prioritize the person on the left. Their system would pr prioritize the person on the right who um, comes from a high uh, disadvantaged neighborhood. 
um, and but has a higher short-term mortality. So here, explicit ethical weight is being given to correcting structural inequality, um, inequity. So what do, what do the critics say of this plan? Well, um, you know, one first of all, they say that the narrative description of the whole patient in this article was inappropriate. We shouldn't be factoring in race or ethnicity explicitly, but nevertheless, they listed it in those narratives or what the person does. Um, and that the area deprivation index is the wrong tool for this scenario. It should be used to direct large scale uh, public health uh, interventions, but not explicitly in a triage score. Um, and you know they think in general that you should not use non-medical factors in triage, and that it's not granular enough. They use all these examples of someone you could live in an area with high ADI, but you personally be very well off. And they also are concerned about unintended social factors in triage. Um, and so I'm already over, running out of time. So I'll just end by talking about three different potential equity objectives in scarce healthcare resource allocation, right? This comes actually from the machine learning literature where people think a lot about bias in artificial intelligence and machine learning. First idea is that there should be demographic parity, right? So everyone, regardless of your race or ethnicity or your age or any other characteristic that we're worried about protecting should have equal chance at receiving the uh, scarce healthcare resource. This is probably only practical through a lottery, right? Um, that's in contrast to non-discrimination, which is that a score should not be biased against a racial ethnic group and not exacerbate healthcare disparities like SOPA would. So what I'm, my lab's currently working on is ways to debias the SOPA score, which could involve directly modifying the, the renal component or using place-based disadvantage indices to um, in kind of get two ethical birds with one stone, prioritize the disadvantage and uh, save more lives by debiasing the score. But then finally, the last idea is that you get points above and beyond preventing non-discrimination by actually actively trying to correct structural inequity with your system. Um, so I'm gonna skip a lot of slides and just thank my outstanding co-authors and mentors and the McLean Center overall, Mark and, and Lainey, um, the ones who got me on this path. And then uh, Albert Wong, my KO8 mentor and, and Monica, of course, um, have all been instrumental in my next couple of steps in my career. And then my outstanding co-authors, Gina Sello and Kelly Mickelson, all McLean Center affiliated people working together and um, can't wait to keep, keep after it with them. So thank you. Well, we're at three for three and using all of our time so far in the, uh, in the pandemic. I, got, I, have, I have one minute, it says. No. Oh, yeah. No, it's okay. I, I, uh, no, I think we can move on to get to dinner, right? Unless anybody has any burning questions, uh, but we can always chat more. So thanks. Thank you. Great, great. I, that's all. You're good. I'm in, <laughs> next up, Aaron DiMartino. This is way higher now. <laughs> Okay, Erin DiMartino is a graduate of Williams College in Dartmouth Medical School, where she also completed an internal medicine residency. She did pulmonary critical care fellowship at Mayo, where she is now an assistant professor. And she is since she's a 2016 graduate from the McLean Center. And since the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, she's been dividing her attention between frontline patient care in the ICU and serving on Minnesota's Pandemics Ethics Task Force. And I can't wait to hear everything that you have to tell us today about pragmatism, fairness, and prognostic humility in state policies allocating scarce critical resources. Hi, it's such a pleasure to be back. Thank you for the invitation, Dr. Angelos and Dr. Siegler. Um, Fortunately, I had looked at the lineup and knew that Will would probably optimistically assume that Will would be covering some of the material that I normally cover, so this should make my talk a little bit more efficient. Um, so I'll start by reintroducing myself by way of my disclosure slide. Um, I identify as an intensivist and an, an ethicist, which means that whenever I look at an ethical problem, I do so with one foot planted firmly in the ICU. 
Um, and I think that's exactly, I hope, that's exactly the way Dr. Siegler had envisioned his fleet of clinical medical ethicists as we went out in, to pursue our medical careers across various disciplines. So I'm gonna start with a vignette from about a year ago. I'll talk about the policy approach to handling the clinical problem. I'll talk about the hazards, some of the hazards of that approach and an investigation that I have that's ongoing um, into kind of exposing and understanding better those hazards. And then I'll share what actually my lived experience has been as an intensivist in the ICU during these times. Uh, and end with some reflections. My objectives would be for you to uh, be able to name two pragmatic challenges posed by COVID era crisis standards of care triage policies, had they been implemented or declared, and then to define prognostic humility. And again, there's a kind of a growing momentum throughout the day around uncertainty and humility um, that's, I think, very helpful in setting us up for this topic. So my vignette is actually taken from my experience only three weeks after I delivered my last McLean Center conference or uh, lecture virtually. Um, and that lecture was about how we were teetering on the edge of crisis standards of care and this kind of extreme contingency um, circumstance where we weren't formally allocating resources and yet there was a lot of ad hoc rationing going on without any formal oversight and um, what hazards that posed to patients uh, both within the hospitals and those yet trying to get into the hospitals. So in this vignette, it's two o'clock in the morning uh, in December of 2021, your ICU is filled with high acuity uh, COVID-19 patients. It is true that one of my nights supervising our 32 bed medical ICU, 15 of our patients were prone, mechanically ventilated in the prone position, many of them on other forms of life-sustaining therapies like dialysis and vasoactive medications as well. Uh, a patient has just died, and so the room is being sanitized. And this is the first open bed in the medical ICU for three days, and yet there have been hourly calls requesting from outlying hospitals in a three or four state re, uh, area asking for one of our ICU beds. And the transfer center now calls you with several COVID positive candidates, because at this point in time, uh, not only are we in the medical ICU only handling COVID positive patients, but they're spilling out into all the other intensive care units around the hospital. So there's a 28 year old man with an elevated BMI, but single organ failure, respiratory. Uh, there's a 76 year old woman, hospital day three now, uh, who's at baseline oxygen dependent COPD now with fever and shock and a 58 year old man hospital day two CKD stage 3A at baseline now with oliguric renal failure being temporized medically until he can uh, arrive at a hospital that can deliver dialysis. So all of these patients are in emergency departments in critical access hospitals. So they don't have the skill set to say intubate and manage a patient who's mechanically ventilated. They can't paralyze prone patients. Um, and so they're being non-invasively ventilated on 100% FiO2. So they're on CPAP, 100% oxygen, various degrees of other organ system dysfunction, varying ages. What do you do? So the policy answer uh, would be to look at the policy books, uh, again, assuming that your state had declared a crisis standards of care and you, that you had a clear protocol to follow. But let's just make that assumption that you're allowed to refer to this policy that has been um, in some states vetted and debated and considered for many, many years, uh, although in other states cobbled together very quickly in March of 2020. Um, but most states have some kind of guidance. Sometimes that guidance consists only of ethical ethical guidance, but doesn't um, kind of venture into clinical instruction about how to differentiate one patient from another. Um, but many states also offer written triage procedures of the sort that Dr. Parker has just mentioned. So where a triage officer or a group of triage individuals or uh, individuals is assigned as a triage 
team to relatively prioritize one patient against a group of others. Um, and the components, as Dr. Parker has just mentioned, would be um, often would include some kind of score to uh, depict the severity of organ dysfunction at the time of presentation, and often also take into account pre existing state of health. So, burden of comorbid il illness, potentially long term prognosis, and also in some cases, as you've just seen, other patient factors, like if the person is an essential worker, their area of deprivation index, pregnancy. And so this is just a brief detour to talk about work that I have that's ongoing. Um, so we have a paper under review right now where we have, um, where we have tried to better characterize and expose the ways in which um, states have incorporated in these chronic medical conditions into triage schema, and also to look at the prognostic uh, assessments that are being required or requested of triage officers and um, triage teams. And we're also looking at what the resource is that the allocation scheme purports to be allocating, because even that differs from state to state. Likewise, we're trying to um, kind of triangulate that understanding by uh, going to the source and interviewing the individuals who were responsible for um, authoring these policies. And we have found these individuals to be remarkably giving of their time. We've interviewed people from 34 states so far. And so I have a great understanding now of what the different factors and forces were um, that, are be that kind of sit behind what you can read in the publicly available Department of Health websites. Okay, so here's the type of example that set me on this pathway, um, because as an intensivist, it actually gives me palpitations because I have this like two o'clock in the morning vision of what I would have to do if I had um, a, a sheet of paper like this in front of me. So this is excised from one state's policy. I will say if you've seen one state's policy, you've seen one state's policy. They're all different. But you'll actually notice if you look through them, as many of the people in this room have done for other previous projects, you'll notice common templates and tropes that kind of carry over from one to another. And this is too fine print uh, to be meant for you to digest. But I just want to point out a couple of things um, which we were well set up for before. So first of all, this line that's highlighted in blue is around kind of the severity of organ dysfunction at the moment of presentation, which is meant to be encapsulated by that very imperfect SOFA score. And that there is there are lists of chronic conditions, and it was these lists of chronic conditions that really jumped out at me, because to me, as a clinician, they felt very heterogeneous, and they also felt uh, very difficult for me to know as an acute care clinician in the middle of the night how I would assess somebody's um, severity, even if I knew they had a given diagnosis. And so, um, you know, if you have one of the, uh, I think it is major, yes, major on the left, <laughs> um, then that would be, that would confer a certain number of additional points. And it's even worse, of course, if you have a severely life-limiting illness, which is circled right now. But, what are these different diseases? For instance, you'll see that, that Alzheimer's makes many of the lists, um, moderate versus severe. How exactly do I grade that in the middle of the night? Malignancy with a less than 10 year expected survival. That's a really difficult assessment for me to make. I don't know if Dr. Hantel or other oncologists would be able to make that in the middle of the night, but that would be a challenge for me. Um, Class two heart failure versus class four heart failure. How exactly do I know how my pa if my patient is frail? Has that formally been assessed in the past? And then the cirrhosis with a history of decompensation uh, or not eligible for transplant. So all of this, um, I think, assumes that we have unfettered access to records and also un 
unrestricted time to go through said records. But in reality, people's experience of the healthcare system is often very fragmented. They seek care in multiple different institutions, which oftentimes don't have crosstalk. And so um, it's a big assumption that I would be able to make this assessment even if I did have access um, to all of somebody's medical records. Then there's the question of who performs triage. So it could be an individual, it could be a team, what is the expertise, the, con uh, the training and the um, clinical experience of that team. We've just heard from Dr. Dugdale that internal medicine residents were tasked with this at a very stra a stressful and challenging time in New York City. I can tell you that we surveyed um, contributing institutions across our state that were collaborating on writing this policy about how they plan to implement it in their home institution. And we found wildly diverse approaches to who should be making, uh, assigning the scores, uh, ranging from nurses to the bedside cl clinicians to a group of clinicians who had a firewall and had no access to the medical record and kind of every permutation in between. So then, if somebody is going to have access to their medical record, exactly how should they navigate through that record? Should they have, um, you know, kind of free reign within there, or should there be a choreographed approach to uh, looking through a patient's chart that is um, simulated or that is repeated for each patient, all comers, so that there isn't a risk of kind of doing a deeper dive in specific patients' charts, whereas you're not doing a systematic review of others. Um, I think it's important to raise the point that the more time you spend in a chart, the more likely you are to be exposed to prejudicial details a photograph of the patient, information about their family, their occupational history, their carceral history. And need I remind you that this all has to happen in the middle of the night. Uh, it has to be a lean process to allocate the scarcest and most life-saving resources of all in the intensive care unit. The state of Washington has actually taken a really um, measured and iterative iterative approach to developing a list to walk um, their triage teams through assignment of scores and to look at this assessment of past medical history. And um, I would just point you to this resource. It's publicly available on the Department of Health website. And they are specifically looking only at conditions they believe confer a worse likelihood of survival to hospital discharge. And that's important, that very narrow scope of prognostication. So again, when we talk about fairness, at, at a minimum, I think that the process should be consistently applied to all patients that also that process, we need to be attentive to how we ascertain not only a quali disqualifying condition or deprioritizing condition, but also things like how we would ascertain if somebody is an essential worker and how we would ascertain if a person is pregnant. And also, can the schema achieve its stated objective? In many, but not all states, the stated objective is to maximize lives saved. And we have to ask ourselves, as Dr. Parker just has, um, are the tools that we're using, the instruments we're using, really getting us closer to maximizing lives saved? So the Office of Civil Rights, speaking of fairness, wanted uh, has been reminding policymakers and clinicians of uh, almost 50 years worth of legislation that protects federal civil rights legislation protecting individuals against age discrimination, disability discrimination, and specifically mentions that there should not be categorical exclusion criteria on the basis of disability or age, and that judgments um, shouldn't be made about long-term life expectancy. And what we have found in the paper that's currently under review is that those are still highly prevalent across the US. So um, here's another example of a policy that uh, gave me pause as soon as I saw it, specifically that line D about metastatic malignant disease with a poor expected response to therapy. 
It's just extremely vague language that I don't know how I would be equipped to answer in the middle of the night. And if you look at the heading, these are exclusion criteria for um, mechanical ventilation during rationing. And then also this coexistent end stage failure of a major organ, and they give some examples with poor prior prognosis. So leaving things really wide open for the interpreting clinician. So here we get to humility. First of all, I think we need to acknowledge uh, not only all of the holes that were pointed in, uh, that were kind of dr drilled into our um, minds about the inadequacies of our current triage schema, schemata, but also two or three decades worth of research about the accuracy of prognostic tools in general. So instruments that are even meant to predict survival for people who are enrolled in hospice and that hospice clinicians aren't very good at predicting. And those are supposed to be patients with a six month or less survival. Um, I think the prognostic horizon here matters. I have less difficulty asking a clinician to think about likelihood of survival to hospital discharge than I do a 10-year horizon. Um, and you can just think about how magnified that inaccuracy would, get, would be with each passing month or year of prognostication. It also matters who's prognosticating. Is it an intern? Is it the bedside nurse? Is it a clinician who has access to, say, a specialist in the disease process that the patient has so that they have a little bit more context about the types of therapies they've had in the past for this disease? Um, and finally, I think the language matters. So humility, prognostic humility is such an important concept. It was important in neurocritical care, as we were hearing. It's important in medical critical care at the bedside. But I think it's also really important in policymaking that we be honest about uncertainty and the, um, and the pitfalls of trying to embed these prognostications that sound maybe to somebody who wouldn't have to render them, like they might not be so hard to do. But trust me, these are the types of clauses that, that keep me up at night. So returning to our vignette, let's talk about what really happened because we were operating just several weeks after I last talked to you at the last McLean conference, still outside of the realm of a formal crisis standards of care declaration. And so how did we handle situations like this? Unfortunately, logistics came into things a lot. Who could arrange transport? Uh, who had a helicopter or an ambulance available to move the patient? How close the patient was to our facility or whether they were even within the same facility? I think there's going to have to be a lot more post Post hoc analysis of this question, but I there my intuition is that uh, across the country, these questions of affiliation with the referral centers, the tertiary, quaternary care center, the university, um, is a big and troubling factor in who was uh, taken from these critical ac access hospitals versus who remained. Um, again, there were some assessments of survivability, but often hampered by the fact that we got very little information uh, and there was no opportunity in many cases for chart review. Um, and then there was a lot of talk about, well, this person's been waiting the longest. And so uh, these were the factors that I heard most frequently. So where does that leave us? I think we still have a lot of embedded biases in state crisis standards of care triage policies, and I would venture to imagine, although I haven't analyzed them, this also extends to regional and hospital or institutional policies as well. And that we have incredibly imprecise triage tool and we're need, in need of further development and extensive testing. And I wrote this knowing that I was going right after Will because I know what he's working on and I'm really excited about his work. Um, and we still remain poised for injustice and in a, in a state where we need to be advocating and continually examining these policies. So I'd like to end by thanking my collaborators and uh, my research team back at Mayo. Thank you. We have 30 seconds. Yes, Will has a question. We'll let Will ask. I'll be able to say, um, can HPUs in the
prognostic factor for short term survival in GI? Is it ethical to use age as a prognostic so age in and of itself, I think, is is potentially problematic. Um, I think age uh, bundled with an appreciation of what a person's disease burden is, uh, is less problematic to me. But as a discrete factor, uh, not only from an ethical standpoint, but also from a civil rights standpoint. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. Yay, that's great. Later. We can talk more later. I know there's so many questions, but I'm really sorry. I want to get you to dinner. I'm pretty sure I will never be asked to be the moderator right before dinner ever again. We are now, um, we were supposed to start this at 540. It's 554. I'm doing awesome. Okay, so next up is Megan Collins, who's the um, Allen and Clara Jensen Professor of Ophthalmology, is a pediatric ophthalmologist who provides comprehensive, ooh, I was supposed to take this off, comprehensive clinical and surgical care to pediatric patients and adults with strabismus and treatment of ret retinopathy, oh, wait, 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 in Baltimore, I'm reading this really badly. Listen, she's a pediatric ophthalmologist. She does amazing work about access to eye exams for kids. I love her talks every single year. I can't wait to hear about this. Thank you. Best introduction ever. <laughs> you can moderate all of my panels. Uh, good afternoon or evening, everybody. So nice to be here in person with you. I'm usually, I feel like I've been in my living room for the past couple of years wearing pajama bottoms. So, uh, so wonderful to be here today. I'm going to try to stay on time, maybe be a little bit early as I realize I am the rate limiting step between us and dinner. Uh, so as Emily mentioned, I'm Megan Collins. I'm a faculty member at Johns Hopkins. Uh, is this how I move forward, Emily? Excellent. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about some work I've been doing with my colleague Ruth Faden in the Berman Institute of Bioethics, exploring issues of child well-being, education, and the COVID pandemic response. I have no conflicts of interest. And you're probably asking right about now, why are we hearing from a pediatric ophthalmologist talking about educational ethics? And some of you know, as Emily alluded to, a lot of my work pre-pandemic was really focused on strategies to advance health equity for disadvantaged students through school-based delivery of eye care. And in fact, I'm very happy that this past week we celebrated our 10,000th pair of eyeglasses given to students in Baltimore. Yeah. But what happened on Friday, March 13th, 2020, is all schools shuttered their doors in the United States. Um, and when that happened, some, it was just for the remainder of the 1920 academic year, some, for, it was including Chicago public schools, I think it was for a large amount of the 2021 academic year too. So closing schools, I learned very quickly, not only impacts learning, but it also impacts the delivery of any types of healthcare services that come into the school setting. And this becomes really important when we think about ethics and we think about the interrelatedness of health and education. Healthier students are better learners. This is a concept that's well embodied by the CDC in this whole community, whole child, whole school model, which recognizes that what happens in the school and what happens in the community impacts not only the well being of the child, but also their academic success and their overall health. So that brings us to the objectives of today's talk. I'm gonna talk about um, arguing that there's really a special place of childhood in the ethics of pandemic response planning. And second, I wanna briefly highlight the extent and severity of harms to children caused by both the pandemic and pandemic related policies with a focus on educational disruption for primary and secondary school students in the United States. And finally, I wanna outline a decision matrix that hopefully will help us in future pandemic planning and uh, protecting the interests of children. So let me begin by thinking, by framing for you why childhood is unique from an ethics and justice perspective. And this is largely drawn on work from Ruth Faden and Madison Powers. The first point is really children matter differently from adults. This is from a dependence perspective. Children are completely dependent on others and the social order for their well being. Also, from a developmental perspective, and this is key, harms in childhood can compromise well being in the short term but they can also impact life prospects over the entirety of a child's life. From a structural justice perspective, childhood has a privileged status, just often reflected in international human rights documents. 
With that perspective in mind, I would argue that a lot of pandemic policies in the U.S. and indeed globally often failed to meet these obligations of justice to children. As a result, the well-being and interests of all children were set back, but especially for those who were also disadvantaged even before the pandemic. So when we're thinking about the impact of the pandemic, we are only now beginning honestly to understand the extent and severity of harms for children in terms of both the pandemic and pandemic policies. Importantly, it's honestly very hard to ascertain how many of the harms were causally related by school closures versus other pandemics of the versus other aspects of the pandemic itself or the pandemic response. And we recognize that this is multifactorial. And there were a lot of insults that have happened over the past couple of years that have impacted child well-being. It may have been loss of family income, loss of family members, social distancing policies, disruption of routine services, including, of course, child care, schools, and medical services. It's important when we talk about this to think about the important role that schools have as a critical hub of support, academic and otherwise, especially for students from disadvantaged backgrounds. And with that in mind, many students were doubly harmed by this intersectionality of childhood and disadvantage. This is a great quote from Ruth Faden early in the pandemic, very prescient in saying, as in all public health emergencies, poor children and poor families will suffer the most. An ethically dispensable policy of government school closures needs not only to meet the bar of public health necessity, it must also include active measures to mitigate the disproportionate burden that will fall on our most disadvantaged children. And when we think about the magnitude here, I think it's important to look globally and locally, but UNESCO estimates that over 1.6 billion children were impacted by the pandemic and school closures. In the US alone, it was more than 55 million students. And as mentioned before, the most vulnerable were hit the hardest. Some of those statistics here are pretty staggering when you think about the extent of interruption in um, in-person learning. Some students experience continued uh, disruptions in person learning with variation across the states, as you can see the states in lighter pink and violet being the ones that were closed longer, the ones uh, in darker, deeper violet there being closed for the shortest amount of time. Uh, the estimates are that 20 million students were out of school for at least a month, but I think the more frightening thing is 15 million students were completely out of classrooms for more than four months. And this is done by a group out of Harvard. What's even more striking is that in addition to the, the fact that we know there was variation by state, there's also a striking difference by poverty level. High poverty school districts were the ones that were closed for the highest number of weeks in every single state across the United States. So let's turn a little to the initial risk calculus and some of the considerations that led to school closures. This is not an exhaustive list. But these are some of the key considerations that, that uh, public health professionals were thinking about when they closed schools in the first place, and I would argue appropriately so. High levels of community transmission, prevalence rates, inadequate testing, inadequate PPE, unknown routes of transmission, unknown morbidity and mortality in children, unknown risks of children being asymptomatic carriers, bringing it home to their households, bringing it home to their teachers, no effective treatment at the time, no vaccine, limited hospital and healthcare resources. So early on, there were obviously a lot of convincing reasons. What's missing from this calculus, however, is that these considerations are all related to public health and medical goals, which by no means should be disregarded. However, what's largely missing from the early discussions, and I would argue even more critically from the ongoing calculus, was the risks of the harms and setbacks to children from school closures. And this to me becomes even more relevant as our knowledge and resources changed over time. For example, there was a growth in the availability of testing, there was development and availability of vaccines, improved access to PPE, and largely I would say um, a, co a coalescence around the knowledge about in-school transmission and how to keep children safe in the school. 
So some of you may, particularly those who are parents of school-aged children, may have seen some of this data that's come out from the National Assessment of Educational Progress, which shows, of course, what have been regarded as big drops in math and reading achievement for children during the pandemic. Um, but what has largely been ignored, I think, is the role that schools play in the non-educational well-being of children. And what largely has not been measured is the impacts that school closures have had in all of these areas. And this includes social and emotional learning, provision of food services, health services, which includes screenings and vaccinations for lots of kids, mental health and counseling services, safe buildings for students in unstable housing, and adult supervision during work hours, particularly when parents are essential employees. All of these services were disrupted when schools were closed. This is some work out of the Center for Reinventing Public Education. It's, it's a busy slide, but it really starts to um, point out some of the both short and long-term impacts when schools were closed, including this exponential rise in mental health issues, which we've heard about with our, particularly our adolescent population, food insecurity, loss of a caregiver, and disruption of school health services. So I would argue now there's sort of a universal consensus that schools were closed for longer than yet necessary to secure public health um, aims and imposed unjustifiable harms for many children. And, you know, midway through the pandemic, I think we started seeing articles like this in the New York Times and U.S. News, close the bars, open the schools. That's really become a rallying cry. Um, but the question is, how do we do that? What does that require, not only in the current, but in future pandemics? And this brings us to thinking about ethical considerations for children in pandemic planning. And again, revisiting the justice perspective, I think we need to take a very broad view of child well-being. Consider that the impact of any pandemic policy decision, including school disruption on child well-being, and consider it through multiple lenses including developmental stages of children and intersectionality with disadvantage. So this is a matrix that is a tool in development at this point in time, but it starts to get it thinking about these additional supports and things that schools are so essential for and the fact that their impact may differ by age, whether we're talking about the early childhood population versus the adolescent or secondary school population. At a minimum, I would argue that policymakers should be considering each of these dimensions of well being as it relates to any pandemic policy decisions, especially about school disruptions. And for each age category, they should be asking is it neutral? Is it negative? Is it positive? An additional layer, of course, is thinking about the differential impact for children who are already disadvantaged. For any negative responses, there should be the next question how do we mitigate that impact? This is an iterative process and ongoing as new data is available. With this mapping done, policymakers can then import it into their overall assessment of the justifiability of any policy at hand. And we would argue, of course, a bit of a moral thumb on the scale when the interests of children are being weighed against the interests of the community at large or other population groups. I feel like I'm ending on a sad note to tell you that I don't think this is the last pandemic but Dr. Landon will be employed for forever. Um, but, and we can't assume the next pathogen is going to uh, behave in the same way as COVID has. But I think we need to learn from some of the miscalculations and pandemic responsiveness during the current pandemic and have a greater emphasis on child well-being and future pandemic planning. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Megan wins the award for actually finishing within time for questions or going to get dinner. Um, but wait, no, but seriously, does anybody have a question for Megan? Be, being a horrible person that I am, I'm gonna say something. I, I want to say kids were schools were closed in, in my opinion. School schools were closed initially for real safety issues, and they were kept closed in order to keep the economy open to get other people back to work and keep the economy going. Um, and this is what I'm talking about when I talk about knowing whose interests are on that scale about what is of benefit. Children are seen as a, it, most of what happens in public health, I think is largely a, um, a utilitarian argument. And children are a small group. 
so are immunocompromised, so are disabled individuals, so are high risk individuals. And they, they don't always get the thumb on the scale that, that you think that they need and that I, I think they need to. Okay, sorry, that's my soapbox. No, thank you. Uh, I would just like to add, it's just so wonderful to be here. Peter, congratulations on, on becoming director. Mark, it's so nice to be here with you. I remember when I used to uh, help plan this wonderful conference. And I feel like I've been here through so many different stages and iterations and you and your leadership and Lainey have both been so critical to my career. So thank you. I think that's it, right? So uh, I'll, I'll just say uh, thank you all very much. Um, dinner is on the 10th floor. And so, um, we are gonna go there for a reception now. For those who are online, you're on your own. Tomorrow morning, 8 a.m. See you then.